hope you're enjoying uh, this time that we're spending in the Psalms. And uh, I, loved, I loved last week where XG was sharing Psalm 100. How good was that? It was very good. It was great to, to see them just sharing the Word of God and uh, being confident to speak about it. It's uh, just a good thing. And uh, this week they go off to the Youth Alive Believe Conference, which is fantastic. Uh, I think I, we've got about 30 people going, something around that number. Is that right? Something like that. So uh, be praying for our youth leaders. <laughs> they're going to need help. <laughs> they're they're going to have a great conference uh, over at the Dora Hope Church. Uh, it's going to be, a, a, you know, t- I think three nights, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday nights. Come back Friday night. Yeah, but there's still a Planet Boomer on Friday night. Yeah. I'm leaving. I'm leaving before Planet Boom. I just don't think I could handle the, the, the noise. But uh, I don't know. <laughs> I'm getting old. No. I'm going to be there, but I don't think I'm staying for Planet Boom because I don't want to get home at midnight. But we'll, we'll see. We'll see. It's going to be good. Psalm 96 we're going to jump into this morning. And uh, it's a, a great psalm. I'm going to read the whole psalm and then we're going to unpack some of it, not all of it. It says, sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord, all the earth. Sing to the Lord, praise his name. Proclaim his salvation day after day. Declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous deeds among all peoples. For great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. He is to be feared above all gods. For the gods of the nations are idols. But the Lord made the heavens. Splendor and majesty are before him. Strength and glory are in his sanctuary. Ascribe to the Lord, all you families of nations. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Bring an offering and come into his courts. Worship the Lord in the splendor of his holiness. Tremble before him all the earth. Say among the nations, the Lord reigns. The world is is firmly established. It cannot be moved. He will judge the peoples with equity. I love love that verse there. The The world is firmly established. It cannot be moved. I like this. There's a whole bunch of people around the place sort of saying the world's going to pieces. Well, the word of God says it's established and it can't be moved. It's sort of sort of different to what other people are saying. That's not discounting global warming, by the way. But, but, you know, people are getting worried about sort of things they probably shouldn't worry about because it says the world is firmly established. It can't be moved. I mean, this world will be moved one day because there's a new heaven and a new earth, which is interesting in itself. But uh, until then, this one can't be moved. Let the heavens rejoice, let the earth be glad, let the sea resound at all that is in it. Let the fields be jubilant and everything in them. Let all the trees of the forests sing for joy. Let all creation rejoice before the Lord, for he comes to judge the earth. He will judge the world in righteousness and the peoples in his faithfulness. A fantastic psalm. So Father, we just thank you for your word this morning. I pray as we come under this word that we would get a fresh revelation of some things. That Holy Spirit, you would speak to us and help us to understand more of what this psalm is all about. And we ask for that in Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. Hey, this is a psalm of celebration. It's a psalm of triumph. And much of it is re- reproduced from 1 Chronicles chapter 16, verses 22 to 33. If you want to go and look at 1 Chronicles, you can. And in 16, verses 22 to 23, a lot of this psalm is actually already there. And it was a psalm of celebration when David brought the Ark of the Covenant back to Jerusalem. So there was a time when the, the, the Ark of the Covenant wasn't in Jerusalem. It wasn't the presence of God wasn't in the temple because it had been captured by the Philistines and uh, then they recaptured it and they were bringing it back to Jerusalem and things went pear-shaped because they weren't doing it properly. So they left it at somebody's house. I think it was Obed-Edom's house. And, and, and his house got blessed. Like he had the Ark of the Covenant in his house. And, and it's, it talks about how his fields just grew. The, his, his crops and the harvest and everything just went, went gangbusters. And obviously that report got back to David and he thought, you know what? 
We should have that in Jerusalem. We need to figure out how to get it from Obed Edom's house up to, up to here again. And so he went before the Lord, figured that out, and they brought it back up to Jerusalem. And this psalm was again sort of re, rewritten and resung as a triumphant psalm as they brought the presence of God, the Ark of the Covenant, back into Jerusalem and put it in its rightful place. So they were saying, sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord, all the earth. Sing to the Lord. Praise his name. Proclaim his salvation or declare his salvation every day, day after day. Declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous deeds among the peoples. The psalmist is actually encouraging fresh and new praise to be sung. And the reason the psalmist is encouraging fresh and new praise is because nothing stale benefits or befits the praise of the Lord. We don't want to get stuck in stale praise. We don't want to get stuck in old things that are, that are, that are just stale. There, there are some good old things that we should, should keep. You know, there are some great old hymns, but sometimes things are stale. It, there could be even choruses that we've been singing for a while that have just become stale. And, and the psalmist is saying, sing to the Lord a fresh song. Sing to the Lord a new song because you don't want to bring anything stale before the Lord. The new song is, an, is not just a newly composed song, though it includes that, but it's actually a response from us that matches the freshness of his mercies that are new every morning. It's a fresh response. It says, when you come into his house, sing a new song. Have a, have a fresh response to his goodness this morning. Even though we may be going through some things, even though you, know, you may not be having the best of weeks, it says, come into the sanctuary, come into the, the house of God and sing a fresh song. Find a fresh song in your spirit and, and, and sing it out to the Lord. We actually get to respond to his goodness afresh. It's saying, hey, you've got a, a moment in time right now to respond to the goodness of God with a fresh song. We have an opportunity in these moments when we come into his house to be thankful and grateful. And our worship time, which we've had this morning, is not just filling 20 to 30 minutes so we can get to other things. It's actually the most powerful time we could have in the whole of the service because we get to have a fresh response to the King of Kings. We actually get to come before him with singing. We get to come before him with gladness. We get to come before him and we get to clap our hands. The scripture says, clap your hands, all you people. Because if you don't, he's going to make the trees clap. And that would be pretty interesting to see gum trees clapping. You know? And I don't want that to happen. I don't want a gum tree clapping in my place. I don't want a rock yelling out in my place. I actually want to sing a fresh praise to God. No matter what. You know, no matter what's going on, we come into the house and we find a place where we can be thankful and we can be lovers of Jesus who just want to praise him. The interesting thing in, this, in these first few verses is having praised and focused upwards because the, 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 the psalm takes us upwards. It's saying, sing to the Lord a new song. You know, sing to him, sing to him. It's all about him, which is what we were seeing. Just give me Jesus. Just give me Jesus. Sing to him. And then it switches to declare his glory among the nations. So there's a, there's, a, there's a big switch to focusing upwards and focusing towards heaven and then focusing out. Declare the praise. Let the people know that God is good. Let the people know that God does miraculous things. Let the people know that he's answering prayer. We've got more answered prayers in the prayer basket at the moment than we've got prayers, which I think is exciting because we have a living God. He's answering prayer. Let people know. That's our role. He says, come into the house, sing to him, get focused towards heaven. But when you've done that, go out and declare the goodness of God. Go out and declare his name. Go out and declare his miracles. Tell people about him. Let the world know how good our heavenly father is. People need to hear about the goodness of God. I mean, you only need to watch the news every night. And I do watch the news a, a bit. I watch SBS. But, you know, it's, it's depressing at times. You know, last night, I don't know if you saw the news, but, man, this, this, this mudslide just wiped out this town in, in Japan. It was horrendous. I just sort of went, oh. I, 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 it was so bad that I stopped it, paused it, rewound and said, Phil, you've got to come see this. This is terrible. And, and it's like this horrible thing happened. I thought, oh, wow. 
We could dwell on that, but we need to tell people God is good. God is great. He's doing amazing things. And, uh, you know, we just need to keep letting the world know that, yes, things happen. There's all sorts of things going on around the world right now. But God is still good. It hasn't changed his goodness. It hasn't changed how he, how he is. So this psalm in these first few verses are actually suggesting a pattern that we should come and focus on the Lord, then we should go and tell people about him. It's just a pattern. Come, focus on God, then when you go, tell people about him. That's what we should be doing. Psalm 71 verses 14 to 18 in the NIV says this, As for me, I will always have hope. That's a really good psalm to underline. That's a really good, you know, just just that bit of the psalm. Because I know if you're anything like me, some days you get up and it's, it's, it's a little tough to find hope. You've got you to find it. You've got to pick it up. You've got you to actually you know, say, hang on, hang on, I, I, I've got hope. Even when I'm going through something that's tough and it's difficult, Jesus is with me. He says, I'll never leave you or forsake you. He's always there. There's a reason to have hope. And this psalm in Psalm 71 says, as for me, I will always have hope. Wouldn't that be a good thing to stick on your fridge? As for me, I will always have hope. Maybe it's a good thing to stick men on your shaving mirror or wherever you first get up and look at yourself and go, oh, I just need a shave or, you know, how handsome you look this morning. But, you know, it's it's just like, as for me, I will always have hope. Because we know that you're about to go out into the day and there's going to be some things that might go on. There are maybe some things at work that you're, you're struggling with, uh, things, things in, in, in life that's going on. But it's a great thing to just declare, as for me, I will always have hope. I will praise you more and more. And I would say, if you're going through a difficult time, praise him more and more. You know, I mean, we all go through them. I go through them. You go through them. We all have difficult times. But if we can find our hope, we can start praising him more and more. My mouth will tell of your righteous deeds, of your saving acts all day long, though I know not how to relate them all. Isn't that the truth? I want to tell of your goodness. I want to tell of your your saving deeds. I want to tell of your miraculous things. But I don't actually know how to relate them all. I will come and proclaim your mighty acts, sovereign Lord. I will proclaim your righteous deeds, yours alone. This is telling us so much about declaring the goodness of God, proclaiming him to other people. Since my youth, God, you have taught me, and to this day I declare your marvelous deeds. It's great to be taught by God of how to declare his marvelous deeds. In verse 18, even when I'm old and gray, sort of getting there, even when, I'm old and gray. Do not forsake me, my God, till I declare your power to the next generation, your mighty acts to all who are to come. Gray heads. We should have a little club. (laughs) I used to be blonde, but you know. (laughs) Those of us who are getting older, those of us who are becoming more senior, it's our job to declare to the, the generations underneath us, how good God is, you know, to our children and to their children's children, to just declare to the generations the goodness of God. And the psalmist is saying here, you know, Lord, don't, don't forsake me until I've declared to literally everybody the power of your, your, of your, your power to the next generation, to all who, will, who are to come. It's so important that the next generation understand and know the goodness, the love, and the power of God. I mean, I just love it. Right now, Wendy is doing kids' church while we're in, well, while we're in school holidays, and she, she's, she's sharing testimony. She's, she's declaring the goodness of God. They're doing certain things that, that give thanks to God because it's so important that that, that age group learn about how good God is because they're not going to learn at school. I don't think, unless they're going to a Christian school. They're not going to learn, you know, out and about. It's, it, we need to declare to, to our kids the, the most amazing things about God, the truth about God. All our days from youth to our senior years are called to declare and to tell of God's mighty power and his saving grace. So much. Literally, this psalm is putting it in, in such a way, it's giving us a pattern which says praise and tell, praise and tell. 
praise and tell. Praise God, tell others. Praise God, tell others. Praise God, tell others. Let's get that into our spirit. Praise God, tell others. Praise God, tell others. You know, it's, it's so important. And, and I think all of us probably get comfortable at times where we're not, we're not really telling other people about him that much. We might think, oh, well, if they ask me, I might tell them. We need to actually ask Holy Spirit to give us opportunities to tell people about the goodness of God. Because it's, it's not about us keeping it to ourselves. It's great to be here this morning. And it's great to praise God. But there's so many people out there that need what we have. They need to know Jesus. You know, we're saying, give me Jesus. There's a lot of people in our town, in our community, in the city of Wynyard, in the city of Burnie, in, in Somerset. I'm calling it a city. It's a town. But, um, you know, it's uh, in the spirit. You know, it's, it's a city. But um, people need to know Jesus. And if we don't tell them, you know, very rarely do people stumble in the door of the church on a Sunday morning and think, oh, I've come to church. I don't, know. I don't know how I got here. That does happen occasionally, just occasionally that does happen. But normally people get invited to church. Normally people get to know you and you've told them some of the great things about Jesus or about God or what's going on in your life, what he's doing. And they think, you know what? I'd like to come. I'd like to find out more about this Jesus you're talking about. I'd like to find more about the hope you seem to have in your life because I know the things you're going through, but you've got hope. I need to find out more. And so, so, so they come. They come because we tell. They come because we invite. They don't come because we come to church and praise. They come because we come to church and praise. We get into his presence. We get equipped. We get filled. And then we go out and we tell challenge this week maybe if you've never ever done it before is tell one person about the goodness of God don't expect them to go that's amazing I just need to come to church because it probably won't happen it might but it'll sow seed that God is good that's what we do we sow seed he said get out there and sow seed let people know praise and tell praise and tell tell people about the goodness of God Verse 4 in, in, the, in the psalm we're looking at, Psalm 96, says, For great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. He is to be feared above all gods. For the gods of the nations are idols, but the Lord made the heavens. Our God is the only true God. And he alone is to be reverenced or feared because he is the creator of all things. Again, I think sometimes we, we, as we've been Christians for long periods of time, we may, we may forget just how amazing God is, that he's the creator of all things. He created the world, the universe, the stars. Sometimes you need to walk outside on a, on a, on a starry night and look up and just go, wow, God, you're amazing. And so when we see things like that, we remember how good he is and how magnificent he is. You know, we don't think really of the things like the grass growing. In summer, it grows too quickly. And I have to talk to him and say, Lord, you know, my grass is growing too quickly. You think, couldn't, couldn't, you, couldn't the Lord have created grass that only grew to a certain length and then it stopped? You know, it's like, but no, he sustains all things. The grass grows because he allows it to grow. You know, we might not think very much of that. The wind and the rain come because he allows it to come. He creates it. The lung tissue that lines your lungs that let you actually breathe, he created and he sustains. He's amazing. Your eye. You've only got to think about the eye and how magnificent it is. And, you know, if you, if you remember back to your school biology possibly, and we, when you looked at the eye and you dissected everything and looked at it, and it's incredible that it even works. That's our creative God. And we need to remember that he's the only true God. The gods of the nations are worthless idols, it tells us. They're man-made constructs. They're, 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 they're systems made by man, whether physical or intangible. It could be sport in our country. It's one of the, one of the gods of Australia, sport. I love sport. Sport is good, but not when it gets elevated above God. Celebrities, when they get elevated above God, We've got problems. When we elevate people, celebrity people above God, we've got problems. When we elevate money above God, we've got problems. It says in the Bible you can only serve 
You can't serve both God and money. So serve God and let money work for you. But if you serve money, God comes second, doesn't work, becomes an idol. Houses can become idols. Facebook can become idols. You know, there's a a strong challenge to us not just to accept the current philosophies and beliefs of our times and elevate them above our God and his truth. There's only one truth, and it's God. But but the the current, current world system would like to suck us into all sorts of things where we start to think, oh, yeah, that's pretty amazing. Maybe we should believe that, or maybe we should believe that. There's a whole bunch of stuff happening around, you know, the world at the moment with all sorts of weird theologies that aren't even true. There's a thing called, at the moment, uh, eco-theology. You may not have come across that one. It's a new one to me, but it's eco-theology. And they're trying, to tap, they're trying to tap sort of looking after the planet into theology. Theology is the study of God. It's got nothing to do with the study of forests. But people are now trying to put things together to create something different. There's affirmation theology which is a thing where we're supposed to just love and accept absolutely everything. The Bible doesn't tell us to do that. Theology does not tell us to do that. And we need to be careful that we don't get sucked in to what Facebook feeds us because that's where it's coming from a lot of the time. It's coming through Facebook feeds. It's coming through all sorts of things. Now, please don't get me wrong. I like Facebook, but not when it's trying to actually change what you think. I like Facebook because I can send my friends Happy birthdays. I like Facebooks because you can see some great photos of people just having a great time doing life. But the insidious stuff that comes through it, which tries to change our thinking, is wrong. And it's, and it's not helpful. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 2-4 to 4 say this in the Passion Translation. It's Paul talking to Timothy. He says, proclaim the word of God and stand upon it no matter what. I feel like we're living in a day where standing on the Word of God is going to be really important. Because the Word of God is complete truth and you can't play with it and it's immovable. And, and I think we're heading into a day where that's going to be challenged. It says, rise to the occasion, preach when it's convenient and when it's not. Preach in the full expression of the Holy Spirit with wisdom and patience as you instruct and teach people. For the time is coming when they will no longer listen and respond to the healing words of truth because they will become selfish and proud. They will seek out teachers with soothing words that line up with their desires, saying just what they want to hear. They will close their ears to the truth and believe nothing but fables and myths. How powerful is that? That's word of God. And and it's telling us to be careful. Paul, 2,000 years ago, saw today, He probably saw a whole bunch of other things as well. But he saw today and he said, make sure that you preach the word of God and stand upon it no matter what. Because the time will come when people no longer listen and respond to the healing words of truth because they only want to hear what they want to hear. They're going to invent their own gospels. They're going to invent their own things. They're going to invent their own stuff because they only want to hear things that tickle their ears. They don't want to hear some of the hard truths of the Word of God. They don't want to hear that, that you know, things have actually got boundaries. There is some black and white. There is no grey in God. But they're going to create these little clubs and these little places where they can just get what they want. And I see it. I see things, I see things on Facebook where people are just liking what they want to hear. Some, some random person puts out some random thing and everybody, oh, that's amazing. And when you actually read it, it doesn't line up with the word of God. Some, somebody randomly prophesies something and oh, like, 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 like. And you go, who are they? Who are they? This person that's put this thing out. They're not established prophets. They're not, they're, they're, they're not, they're not you know, they, some might be. Like, you know, honestly, If Graham Cook puts out a prophetic word, are you going to listen to it? Answer, yes. Why? Established prophet worldwide. You know, by many denominations say, this guy's a prophet. If Simon McIntyre puts out something about the cross, which he's just done in his new blog, are you going to listen to it? Yes. 
because he's a man of God who has track record. If some random puts out something from somewhere, and a lot of it, unfortunately, does come from the United States, and you just go, oh, like it, like it, like it. (laughs) We can get so sucked in because all we're doing sometimes, if we're not careful, is just liking things we want to hear. And we need to be really careful because a lot of them are not based on truth. They could be well-meaning, but we're listening to what we want to hear. Now, look, we can all fall into that trap. Let's face it. I'm a cyclist. I love it. I'm enjoying the Tour de France. I like a lot of Tour de France posts. And then what happens? They send me more. Because the algorithm knows that I like cycling and Tour de France. So I'm getting all these posts. I'm getting bombarded, literally, with all these posts from the pedal mafia, from the, um, the band of climbers, all these people that I don't really even know, but they just start coming to my feet. And I sort of go, oh, do I want to like them? Or like, who are they? You know, it just happens. You start liking random things and oh, the, the Facebook does the algorithm. Oh, we better send them some more of that. They seem to like... Prophetic words that from, from nobody. <laughs> so let's send them some more. And they'll like them. You know, and that'll give people a profile. Be careful, people. Please. I'm your pastor telling you. Just be careful. Because there is an insidious way that the devil wants to take us out of truth. And, 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 and get us to believe things that we just want to hear. Because we go, oh, that sounds nice. And you're like, it's not truth. We've just got to be careful. And that's what Paul saw so long ago. It's incredible to think that Paul, who never had internet, who never had um, Facebook and things like that, he says, I can see a day when people are just going to get what they want, gather people around them who will just tell them what they want to hear. See, today we can go onto the internet and we can just look at what we want to hear. We can find the people that align with us and tell us what we want to hear. And it's not always truth. So I would just say be really careful who you're listening to. For Paul foresaw the day when many in the church would be led astray, gathering people who affirmed them and told them what they desired to hear. And he warned Timothy, it's evil. Which is quite amazing that Paul could see that. He, he, he's talking about the church. He's not talking about the world. He's actually talking about the church. And he saw it. And, and this, this psalm is telling us to make sure that we just stick to the one God, the only true God. Don't look at the world systems. Don't look at what the world is trying to, to make us swallow because a lot of it is rubbish. And it's just important that we know that. Why don't the music team come back? That would be, be really good. Some wonderful and powerful words are found in this fantastic Psalm 96 that we've been looking at. And three questions that I have this morning are this. Having praised, having come into, the, into God's house this morning and praised and worshipped, who will we go out and tell this week about his goodness? Remember, it's praise and tell. Praise and tell. Who are we going to tell? Is it a friend? Is it a family member? Is it a work colleague? Is it somebody in the supermarket? Somebody that you sit next to in the doctor's surgery ask Holy Spirit don't make it a burden just ask Holy Spirit would you give me one person this week just to tell about the goodness of God second thing is what truth about Jesus will we declare to others the psalm tells us to sing and declare sing and declare sing and declare What truth will we declare about Jesus to others this week? And the third thing, third question I want to ask this morning is, is there somebody we should stop listening to? Is there? Ask yourself, ask Holy Spirit, is there somebody I should stop listening to because it's not helping me? Because the more I listen to them, the more stuff I get from Facebook, the more I'm actually going to be down a path that takes me away from God rather than closer to God. 
miracles. They're just telling you, for some reason, what you want to hear. Now, all of us want to hear good things. All of us want to hear affirming things. We've got a God who affirms us. He's the King of kings and the Lord of lords, and He says that you're amazing, that you're wonderfully made, that you're the apple of His eye. He says that you are magnificent. He gives you gifts, and He's the one we need to focus on, not the rubbish that so easily gets thrown around these days. You won't find rubbish in this book. It won't lead you astray. It might get you to look more and more into the truth of God. Can we be careful that this book's more important than the Facebook? Because it really is. Father, we thank you for your word this morning. We thank you for the beautiful things in your Psalms. We thank you for the warnings from Paul. We just ask that you would draw us closer and closer to Jesus. In your precious name, amen.